Hey, everybody, Miriam Williamson here. Today is Women's Equality Day. And uh, it seems I almost like, what are we talking about? Like there's a question whether or not women are equal. But um, in terms of how the systems, uh, economic systems, political systems, social systems function, not only in the United States, but in some ways even worse around the world, there is indeed a question. So I thought today a really good thing that we could do is to talk about the Equal Rights Amendment. Yesterday, I spoke in Atlanta, Georgia, at the National Organization of Women's Conference there. And the big topic was uh, the Equal Rights Amendment. And I wanna introduce you to my two friends who are here with us today, who are uh, great educators for us on the topic of the women's, uh, the Equal Rights Amendment. One is a woman, uh, Nicole Bates, who has been informing me and educating me about this for quite a while. And one is a new friend, Elisa Sales, who I met yesterday in Atlanta. Uh, both of them know each other and they are uh, very active uh, on this issue. So let me tell you who they are. And then we're gonna have a conversation about what the ERA is and uh, why it's so important that we get this done. Lisa is the president of Virginia's National Organization for Women. She's uh, an advisory council member for the National Equal Rights Amendment Coalition, which seeks to ensure the Equal Rights Amendment is enshrined in the U.S. Constitution. Lisa is a former chairwoman of the Fairfax County Commission for Women and previous Mount Vernon District Commissioner. She has worked uh, in the executive office of the president for two governors, a member of Congress, and many state and local officials from both parties. Nicole Bates uh, is an attorney and the founder and executive director of Shattering Glass, a nonprofit dedicated to gender equality and gender equity. She founded Shattering Glass in 2021, following a three-decade career as a transactional tax attorney. Boy, you, you shifted this. <laughs> Nicole lives in Washington, D.C. and in North Carolina with her husband and teenage children. She coaches youth sports. She also volunteers on numerous local and national nonprofit boards. Um, I'm in uh, South Carolina right now, actually, everybody. I am in Rock Hill, South Carolina, where I was campaigning all day. Okay, so let's get right into it, ladies. First of all, I want everybody to know, you know, I, I do feel that at my age, I'm sort of, you know, a keeper of the stories. I'm so old that I remember uh, when Betty Ford, now she remember her husband was Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford became president when Richard Nixon resigned. And Gerald Ford, being a Republican, uh, was against the ERA. Betty Ford, his wife, fought really hard for it and almost made it. This would be the 28th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, and these are the 24 simple words that would radically, please hear me, radically transform uh, the social and economic conditions of millions of women. This is what the amendment would say. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. That's it. That would be the 28th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. And uh, each of us needs to, first of all, I believe, realize how important it is, what a difference it would make. What I've invited uh, Lisa and Nicole uh, here for today is that they are both very knowledgeable and articulate about the history of all this, as well as we, where we are now. And I can tell you already. Uh, one of the things they're going to tell you is that all it would really take at this point is a phone call from the president. And I can tell you that I would make that phone call on day one. Okay, everybody, let's uh, let's start there. Nicole, I've known you for a while. Uh, you uh, told me kind of how we got to where we are, or actually you two know each other. So I'm gonna just going to leave it to you. Who, who can start and tell us a little bit of the history so that people can sort of um, come up to speed on what's happening here? Lisa, you want to do it? You want to no, do it? You take it. <laughs> um. Just briefly, the ERA was um, introduced 100 years ago, um, and we just celebrated the centennial in Seneca Falls, New York, where um, Alice Paul um, came up with the Equal Rights Amendment. And it was finally passed in 1972, overwhelmingly, actually, in bipartisan support in both chambers, and it was sent to the states for ratification. Well, the introductory clause of the Equal Rights Amendment contained um, a time limit in it, a seven-year time limit. 
And at the end of the seven years, they didn't meet, they didn't secure the necessary 38 state ratifications. They had only gotten to 35. In 1992, the 27th Amendment was um, ratified after nearly 203 years. It was originally proposed by James Madison. What is and the 27th Amendment, Nicole? That relates to how Congress can give itself raises. Um, and that one does. <laughs> and there was some controversy obviously surrounding that amendment. And I'll let Lisa pick up here because she has worked with the archivist who actually published that in 1992. Now, if I might stop here for a moment, mm -hmm. just for people who kind of need to brush up on American history. In 1972, the Equal Rights Amendment did pass both houses of Congress. But mm -hmm. in order for an amendment to become law, to it has to not only pass the uh, Senate and the House, it has to be ratified by 38 states. Now, in 1972, when that did not occur, how, they got to, what, 37? They got almost there, I remember, right? 35. 35. <laughs> yep, 35 states. So it requires two-thirds of Congress before it can be actually sent to the states, and then three-quarters of the states must ratify. We, we say that ERA would be the 28th Amendment, but we're saying ERA is the 28th Amendment by virtue of the fact that 38 states have duly ratified the amendment as of January 20th, uh, 2020. Okay, so back in 1972, they just made it to 35. They needed 38. You're saying as of 2020, the, the 38 state ratified. Correct. But I heard you say was that Donald Trump got out of that by saying it out was outside the time window? Well, he's, he's using, using this, this, this time, time limit. limit. A little bit of an echo. Might have, someone might have to go on mute because I'm getting a lot of feedback. Sorry about that. Um, so um, uh, Donald Trump um, knew that Virginia's ratification was imminent and his administration um, did a preemptive strike. And they issued a memo from the Office of Legal Counsel. We all know that Trump was using the Department of Justice as his own legal firm. And um, knowing that Virginia was about to ratify about a week later, I kid you not, they issued uh, a, an opinion, which is just an opinion. The Biden administration has since changed that opinion, saying that as a result of the time limit, and we do not say deadline because it's not dead, right? Because of the time limit, uh, the, Trump admission, the Trump administration purported that the ERA was no longer um, alive. And we're here to tell you it's alive and well. <laughs> so where does that leave us? When that leave Biden came in, and hold on, I also want to take a moment. I want, I want to, the next topic I want to go to in terms of the timeline is where Biden stands and what Biden has done and has not done. But I want to take a moment so that everybody understands why the business interests represented by the Trump administration and to some extent, apparently by Biden, too, given what he hasn't done, don't want the ERA. Talk about why the resistance to the ERA, because some people might say, well, women should be equal. Why is that so hard to pass? One of you explain to people what the forces are that don't want it to pass. Yeah, so I'll take, it, I'll take it at the beginning, and then, uh, Nicole, maybe you can pick up. So the ERA, there's a reason the ERA is green. The logo is green, and that is concerning pay, right? Equal pay for equal work, and many companies, corporations, the United States of corporate America is not interested in paying women equally and promoting them equally and making sure they have equal benefits. And we're talking not just about corporate America uh, who employs us, but the big insurance companies, uh, the big drug companies. Um, we think this, this is part and parcel to the problem. The, the gender pay gap alone, <clears throat> Marianne, costs American women and their families $1.6 trillion a year in the aggregate. Um, and a stat came out just last week that if you factor into 
Uh, the caregiving duties that go unpaid for a woman, that's another $627 billion a year. There's a lot of money um, on the table, but it's it's actually not just about money. Um, earlier this year, Congress, uh, the Senate held a hearing on the Equal Rights Amendment, and you could hear exactly what the opposition was all about. Um, they're concerned that the Equal Rights Amendment will lead to late-term abortions as protecting reproductive rights, and also that it will provide equality for LGBTQIA plus people as well. And they're concerned about bathrooms and sports, and that's the social aspect of it. That's why we should have gotten in there sooner before all that stuff erupted. Right. Indeed. Yeah. All right. So, well, one of you uh, tell us about Biden. What about President Biden? So I think uh, President Biden is uh, with us. He's a supporter, a great supporter of the Equal Rights Amendment, but he has not directed his archivist to publish the ERA. And uh, the administration's position is that, and this is not wrong, that Article 5 um, has no role, Article 5 of the Constitution, that is, has no role for the president. However, the United States archivist, who was the recently confirmed first female archivist, confirmed female archivist in the history of the United States, does have the power for 106B, U.S. Code 106B, to publish the amendment. And so we're really what the fight is today is for publication and recognition of the Equal Rights Amendment. And we have two resolutions working their way through Congress uh, for that reason. We can talk a little bit more about that um, when, when Lisa, it comes can to I just hop in because I, I don't necessarily agree with you as far as whether or not the um, president is supportive of Thank the you, Equal Nicole. Rights Amendment? I was about to say that. Would we stop apologizing? Would we stop this codependent relationship with the corporate Democrats? Right. To say that the president supports the ERA is like saying the president is the climate president. Yeah, you can say it. They're very good at saying what we want to hear, but then he, uh, given more oil drilling permits than than Trump did. So right, you, where's the action? Yeah, I, I mean, I remember I'm a, I'm a candidate. So, you, you know, thank you, Nicole. You say he supports the ERA. All he has to do is pick up the phone. the phone and call the archivist and direct the archivist to publish. So this is what the Democratic presidents do who are serving the corporates. Oh, I can't. I really would if I could. They can. And when women particularly cover for that, he supports it. So what is he? He supports it the way he supports reparations. Well, I think we should do HR 40, but you know, Congress should look into that. This is the cover they use. Look, I want to honor Jimmy Carter for a moment because he did use his bully pulpit, right? He signed the resolution. And if there's no role for the president, but he wanted a role, right? So he signed a resolution to extend the time limit on the Equal Rights Amendment. So but the president has, can do a lot of things. Well, not only that, if Jimmy Carter were president today, it, it would, would be, be in the Constitution. More states have, have ratified since Jimmy Carter. When you say Jimmy Carter had no role, and correct me if I'm wrong, but what I hear you saying is Jimmy Carter had no role because there were not enough states that ratified. Joe Biden has more of a role. Is that not correct? No, um, that, that's incorrect. Actually, what it, it, it now he does have a role because of Trump's interference. President Trump inserted himself in the, the constitutional <laughs> amendment process. Mm -hmm. What happened was, and this is what I was trying to explain before, is that right before Virginia was about to ratify, three states led by Alabama sued the archivist to keep him from publishing the Equal Rights Amendment. Now, this was in December of 2019. Right thereafter, in January, at the beginning of January in 2020, the Trump administration put out a memo saying the ERA is dead and the archivist can't publish. In doing that, what the Trump administration did is it took the burden of proof from the anti-equality camp and pushed it on the pro-equality people. And to this day, we have not been able to get a court to rule on the validity of the Equal Rights Amendment or compel 
um, publication. So today there's nothing stopping the archivist from publishing other than the fact she's not gonna do it unless she has direction from the president because of all this interference that's happened in the past. So practically speaking, the president of the United States does have a role. Now, because enough states have ratified. Yes. Right. But but adding to that, uh, having tracked down and spoken to the previous archivist, Don Wilson, who was appointed by the Reagan administration, by Reagan, um, and he says that if the president told him to publish the amendment, he would indeed publish the amendment. So Nicole's not wrong when she says that the current archivist is looking for, for the president's work. But here's the problem. This is a little bit more nuanced, right? We need to pursue all paths to equality. We have two resolutions. Uh, Representative Presley has just issued a discharge petition. That's how ERA arrived on the scene with Martha Griffiths way back when in 1971, I believe it was. Um, and so if the archivist goes to publish, it's going to the Supreme Court and we don't have a friendly Supreme Court. However, if we get the archivist to publish and if we get Congress to do its job, we will be okay. more secure in the Equal Rights Amendment. 27 amendments have been published upon receipt of the final ratification, regardless of legal challenges. That and includes the 14th Amendment, and which had rescissions, the same thing that people point to here, saying that some states have rescinded. Um, publication should have occurred on January 2020. We will not be able to enforce the Equal Rights Amendment until publication occurs. Okay. Right. There will be no formal recognition in the courts until we see it published in the Federal Register. But the one thing we haven't mentioned is that the Biden administration, when the when the uh, proponents of equality sued the states of Illinois, Nevada, 22 blue states joined in in the lawsuit saying you need to publish this against the Trump administration. When the Biden administration came in, they continued to fight against the Equal Rights Amendment in court with the same arguments that the Trump administration made. So for the Biden administration to to today say that they're fighting for the Equal Rights Amendment, that they're calling upon Congress to act. It's disingenuous at best. It's more than disingenuous. Okay, it's a lie, okay? This is the same as the president saying, I'm a climate president because I have green investments over here, but I'm actually ramping up fossil fuel extraction over there. He's saying, I support the ERA over here, but over there, his DOJ is actually fighting against it in court. And for those of us who are Democrats, we've got to stop this codependent relationship with Democratic presidents. If a Republican does it, we scream bloody murder. If a Democrat does it, we continue to to excuse it. So once again, no, he is not supporting the ERA. And this is really important for us to recognize. This isn't personal, Um, but we're never going to get anywhere if we continue to excuse, it's like we excuse the bad boys. And uh, I, I have a, obviously I wouldn't be running if I didn't feel strongly that we shouldn't, if we actually want the ERA to actually pass. So let's talk about why he does it. Because of the tremendous pressure from the business community, because somebody in the White House is telling the president for all the reasons that Nicole said, when Nicole was pointing out the, um, Uh, the reasons that the anti-ERA forces don't want it. Somebody in the White House is telling the president that it will be bad for the Democrats politically because people will come at them. And this is what happens time after time after time again, when the Democratic Party sacrifices its own purported principles for political purposes. And it's not getting us anywhere. And um, and I even want to take on this issue that when when Lisa, when you were talking about the different things we have to do, okay, I want to talk about the Democratic Party today versus the Democratic Party when I was a child. So you mentioned Ayanna Presley. So Ayanna Presley, they have brought something in Congress that they wish that the president would do it, right? That's what they've done. They've okay. Let's the, re- the, the the Presley resolution is to affirm, validate, recognize, choose your word, uh, the ERA. Okay, she's not stupid. She knows that that will go nowhere. 
she knows that it, it doesn't mean anything except that she gets a good uh, performative flow on Twitter. That's all that that means. It's all performative. Because the only thing that would really make the difference at this point is if the president picks up the phone. So the Democratic Party, when I was young, Ayanna Presley, Ilan Omar, Pramila Jayapal, whoever else believes fle- strongly, would have a press conference. And they would call on the president to pick up the phone. But this is why these people aren't running. This is why they're not endorsing the progressive candidate, because they will only go so far. So the democratic corporatists will only go so far helping people, but only to the point where it will not challenge their donor class. But their donor class, no matter what they do to alleviate people's stress, the donor class will be back to make the return of their pain inevitable. And then the progressives in Congress, the way they act today, they'll only go so far that it doesn't upset the White House or the democratic corporatist leadership in Congress. And they use Twitter to make you think they're really working hard. And they even use bills like that. Oh, we passed the resolution calling for the ratification. And then they can say, oh, we call for the ratification. They know that that means nothing. That is not serious leverage. So one thing you can say about the Republicans, they have a spine. One thing you could say about them, they use their leverage even to the point of overusing, the Democrats are also scared to actually do anything because I'm either going to offend my donor or I'm going to offend the leaders, the the (coughs) corporatist Democrats who are in power. And that's why I believe that we, mainly women, who are trying to change this country, need to change our own codependent relationship with any systems. Uh, I... I, uh, I think we all need to see what's going on here. So no, Biden's not. Biden's fighting for it now. He can say all he wants. He supports it. When you said yourself, Nicole, his own DOJ is actually fighting it in court. Just like he calls himself a climate president, but then he's actually fighting mm-hmm. against the idea that that climate that climate stability is a constitutional right. So tell me if I'm wrong. Am I wrong at all? No. And there really is no precedent. It actually sets a really bad precedent to have to go back to Congress to <laughs> ask for validation and recognition, you know, uh, of a of an amendment that's been duly ratified. It actually interferes with states' rights as well. If you yeah, want to talk a little bit about that. that, and also it just adds to people's hopelessness. It adds to people's sense: why even bother trying? They keep moving the goalposts, right? Every time we get co- close, system, and we've never yeah. been closer than That's we are now. That's what we should be saying to the president. That's keep what moving the goalposts. And it should be the progressives in Congress who are saying, and you know, that's why I'm running because nobody in that system, they're all so locked up. It's not going to happen from there. And so this is one of many ways, we should all be aware of this. This is one of many ways when we, where we assumed that when Biden got into office, he would reverse some of Trump's positions. We 100%. thought he would reverse his position about Assange. Go back to what Obama said. We thought he would, we would reverse his uh, 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 Trump's position on the nuclear uh, a deal with Iran. Go back to what Obama said. It's really amazing to see the places where no, I'll stay with what Trump said, and he's doing now with the ERA. So, what do you suggest that we do, girls? Obviously, I think electing a president who would call up the archivist would be a very good idea. I think Nicole's, um, namely the one who said she will, um, Nicole. I think your point is very well taken. That this is bad for our democracy. This contributes to people thinking, "Why even try?" Right. Why even? Try? Why, why should I go try to ratify the ERA in, in, or any other amendment in my state? Look what they did with the ERA. Even if we do that they'll find a way not to do it. And, but the way the Democrats find a way not to do the right thing is scary to me because at least the Republicans will say no. The Democrats will say yes and then act no. The it's the gaslighting. The gaslighting is an issue. And we need, we've been trying to build a large collection of voices to educate and reach more people because the gaslighting is not stopping. And the more success we have, the more gaslighting occurs. Today, the president tweeted out that he's calling again upon Congress to affirm the validity of, uh, affirm that the ERA has been ratified. His own administration was in court stating that Congress has no role on the back end. It passes the resolution, it goes out into the world, 
and the states do what they're going to do in court. And it is not an accident that the president has an opponent in this election who is tweeting about the ERA. And somebody in the White House said, ooh, we better put out something positive about the ERA. Right. That's how it works. Right. And that's why this campaign is important. And that's why we need a cacophony of voices pressuring the president and pressuring members of Congress to use their bully pulpits like you are right now, Marianne, to get the word out. Because until they hear us all demanding and screaming for the Equal Rights Amendment, I'm not even not saying. enough political will. I think that's the. You first know, thing. you know what? You're. I'm more cynical than you are about all this. They don't care how many voices. Look how many people. Yeah. Let's look at this for a minute. Look at the BLM movement, the Black Lives Matter the largest uh, protest movement in the history of the United States. And there has not been one serious police reform bill that came. It's not it's enough. Not enough. Uh, of That's the politics we all love. No, I, maybe somebody needs to mute. That's the politics we were brought up with that we all like to think is true. At this point, what we need to do, we need somebody with the levers of power who can actually do it. It's this cacophony of voices things. The system doesn't care about the cacophony of voices. The system only cares about one thing, raw power. So when we have someone who actually will call up the archivist, that's when it will happen. Until then, good, good luck with all that cacophony of voices. And that's what people have begun to understand. And that's why there's so much frustration. And that's why there's so much cynicism. And that's why there's so much anger. Now, in the meantime, definitely use your voice. Right. I'm not disagreeing with you, Lisa. I, I'm saying use your voice, but people are smart now. And at this point, you know, the sort of shameless plug here, use your voice to elect the person uh, who will get it done. This is a perfect example of how the system works, everyone. This couldn't be a more of a microcosm of how it really works in, uh, in America today. So and that's why it's so important to elect and champion equality candidates, because this is about a constitutional amendment. But we're going to have to bring laws because once it's in, once it's published, right, our work is just beginning. Tell me, we're, I don't understand that. Please explain that. Yeah, we're going to need to challenge it. We're going to need to bring uh -huh. cases in courts of law to challenge, so, excuse my language, the BS, right? We have the Equal Pay Act. Is it being enforced? No. Does the EEOC have enough man, manpower or woman power or any power? to enforce acts like the Equal Pay Act, to enforce gender discrimination. So we're hoping that the ERA gives laws teeth. Will it be a panacea? We don't know what it's going to bring truly until we test it in a court of law. But the thing is, we need to understand today, right now, without it, women, girls, and LGBTQIA plus people are in dire straits without equal protection, just this past week, there were a couple of decisions against gender affirming care coming out of the 11th Circuit. The Fed, one about Georgia's, the lower court, um, the the lower court said that the ban could not be enforced. But later that day, the 11th Circuit, which is the same as Georgia, but it's the upper court, said that Alabama, um, the ban did take effect. So you're. And they applied the Dobbs lowest level of review. It's going to be very difficult for any of us to establish discrimination claims going forward without the Equal Rights Amendment. Even the, even president, the, president's, new, even the president's new Speak Out Act, for example, right? It allows women and marginalized groups to speak out when it comes to sexual assault and sexual harassment but not broader discrimination. Uh, the, the former Speaker of the House in Virginia, Eileen Fillercorn, who is the first uh, woman speaker and the first Jewish person speaker in the Commonwealth of Virginia, she passed the Speak Out Act. But, it, but without having laws that prohibit, explicitly prohibit sex discrimination, we can't really bring our claims. I will tell you, I was working for a decade um, and, and Nicole has a similar experience. I think it's important that we tell personal stories to get the message out so people can relate. And so people, you know, constitutional amendment, what is that? It's, you know, it's a lot of smoke and mirrors to some. Um, but 
you know, the way it really impacts us is sexual assault, sexual violence. I started to say, I was working for the military industrial complex for a decade. They are an extension of the federal government, these government contractors. I was fired for speaking out on the sexual assaults I endure. And make no beans about it, there's a direct connection between women's lack of equality in America and the violence we experience. And that goes to our long-term wealth gap, our retirement. Women are the poorest of the poor in this country, women heads of household with children and women in retirement. There are more women in nursing homes struggling. Our health care. There's so much um, that the Equal Rights Amendment could buttress. And I think we owe it to your viewers and listeners to tell folks um, how the ERA can help them and why they need to get on this bad line. Anything else, Nicole? Thank you for having us here today. Um, I appreciate your candor um, because you. these you. these issues are so important, and they 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 should not be politicized. Yeah, they were talking about they lives conspiring with the gaslighting, and that's right. you know on this and, and so many things. I, I think really it's also important though to note that. The ERA coalition has 300 groups, including Shattering Glass, including the National Organization for Women. Oh, on yeah, board. You guys. And it, includes, it includes labor unions, faith-based organizations, and it's growing by leaps and met, bounds. And we're calling this a movement of movements. It's an umbrella movement, right? And we, yeah, go ahead. Feel free to give your uh, website addresses, any that you yeah. want. For more information, I would say go to ERA coalition dot org, ERA coalition dot org, and join the fight. And I would send them to publish the ERA dot com. Um, that is um, a project of Shattering Glass, but is part of the National ERA Publication Task Force, which is a collection of activists and organizations that have been working tirelessly on the publication of the Equal Rights Amendment, focused strictly on that. I admire both of you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, everybody, uh, Nicole and, and Lisa sort of exemplify the kind of the spirit, the intelligence, the sophistication, the articulation, the passion, and the perseverance that we need in order to move forward, forward in this country. I certainly agree with them about the ERA. Thank you again, and Nicole, for bringing it to my attention and educating me as you have. And uh, once again, day one, I would uh, call the archivist and simply instruct that she publish. It is as simple as that. Given the fact that we've had the ratification of 38 states, there is no more like, well, I can't, or uh, there's no more I can't in the president, uh, the president we have now. It's simply I won't that's hiding behind I can't or hiding behind whatever, I don't know, hiding behind saying he does support it. God bless, God bless uh, Joe Biden. This isn't personal, but this is about the fact that we all need to wake up right now. And if we want women to have equal rights in this country, we need the ERA. Okay, everybody, thank you very, very much. Go to marianne2024.com, uh, do what you can for the campaign and uh, go to uh, the, the ERA Coalition. ERA Coalition.org. ERA Coalition.what? Org? Org, yes. Okay, ERA Coalition.org. And everybody, celebrate women's equality today and uh, let's all join in committing in whatever we can to making it a reality and not just a concept. Happy Women's Inequality Day. <laughs> God bless everybody. Thank you. Thank girl. you.